Taryn is to us because many people were unfortunately not able to join us today. And so we want to now make the most of the rest of our time back. Um, I'm going to introduce you in a minute to, to our panelists. But while I do that, I, I also want to invite anybody who, well, I want to invite everybody to please, if you are willing to, to share in the chat, why did you decide to join today? That will help Honey and Rosie and Peter and myself to just know um, how to kind of make sure that we, 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 we connected around your intention for being here today. Um, I also want to start now by just while we're waiting for a few more people to join, by creating an opportunity for a few people to say audibly now in the main room, uh, why did you decide to join? And the way that you can indicate that you want to say something is you literally just unmute yourself or you put your, your hand up. It's so interesting, Marinas. Quite a few people have said in the main room when you guys were in the breakout room, I joined because of honey. And that's so wonderful because usually people say, I joined because of Peter Block. But I've now had three people who said, I joined because of honey. I saw honey's name on the list and therefore I had to be here. Anybody else want to tell us, why did you decide to join Marinas? I see you unmuted. We'd love to hear from yeah, you. And then yeah, from I, don't know, I don't mind this, uh, this Peter guy. I'm just here for, for honey. Uh, that's actually my whole story. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you know honey, Marinas? Uh, so I'm very, very privileged to, to have Honey as, as my facilitator for, for our Partners for Possibility Circle. And that is how I know Honey. That's how you so know said, Honey. She and that's why you group that she's going to uh, uh, be on this, uh, on this uh, call today or on, on this session. And I said, I'm signing up immediately. Just signing up. If Honey's there, I want to be in the room. That's fantastic. That's Thank you, there. Marinas. Let's hear from <laughs> Volga Duncan. Thanks, Louise. Um, I must say it interests me when things come from you and having had Peter and I'm locked, I'm added to it was really a, a, a great incentive. But for another reason is it's easy for me. I would like to understand when we talk about a sense of belonging, um, can I get a little bit corporate here? Is how do you really measure that, that, that either you have created that sense of belonging? Because I think there's a a right and a responsibility or responsibility on both sides here, you know, as you reach out to create that sense of belonging, how do you know that you have effectively done so? But also what is the um, a responsibility of the person on the other side to want to belong? I'd like to just understand both sides of belonging and then really what does success look like? How do you know when you belong? How does it feel for you and the other person? Uh, I, we'll see, we'll, Vilda, whether we're going to answer all those really important questions, but it's, a good, it's good to have those as kind of opening invitations for us to speak into. Thank you, Vilda. Um, I want to see whether anybody else, I see Peter is unmuted. We will hear from Peter soon. Putti, do you want to tell us why did you, why was it important for you to join today? Yeah, I, I can quickly say something as well. Uh, I said to Ilse in, in our uh, little session there that, you know, I am actually a geophysicist by profession who branched or decided to uh, do psychology. So psychology for me, you know, the community comes in, 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 comes in front of me. So being able to help the community and, and, and so on and so on, one would need to understand the dynamics, would need to understand, you know, how to go about it and so on. So I, I felt, you know what, this would be the, 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 the platform to launch uh, that sort of things and how, I mean, what, what way to go about it with uh, uh, Peter Block, the man himself around here. And uh, where is that honey? If we could uh, see her, is it a she or a he? You can you're gonna see you're gonna see honey in a minute. So oh, okay, we are keeping you. we will we will spotlight honey in a minute and then you will see who <laughs> honey is. But we're delighted that you're with us, Putty. Um okay, I see okay. there was one other person. I just want to acknowledge Bill Gray for being on the call. Um uh, Peter, this is a story. I don't know whether you can remember the story, but many, many years ago, Peter was invited to go and speak at a conference in in um in America and um, 
for whatever reason, he wasn't able to go. And so he suggested to Bill and the team that I will go. And it's been one of my absolute highlights. And every now and again, Bill shows up in our lives. And it's wonderful to have you with us, Bill. Thank you so may much I, for being here. May I just say it's, uh, it's, it's maybe wonderful for you, but it's wonderful for me and all the people that this kind of thinking has evolved. Uh, and it's, it's life-giving. And I'm, I'm just so glad that you put this thing out a couple of days ago and I'm able to join with you. There. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. So my job, my privilege now is to introduce you to our, um, our, our host, our, our panelists today. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and spotlight them so that you can see them as I speak about them. So the first, first, first person I want to introduce you to is Rosie Cherungoma. Rosie is a colleague of mine. She's a thinking environment practitioner and a learning process facilitator, which means that she has been facilitating a number of Partner for Possibility circles. Her commitment is to create safe and inclusive space, space where people with where connection and belonging are the basis for whatever else we try, we, we choose to do together. So you will hear from Rosie soon. Rosie, it's always an absolute pleasure to have you with us um, on any conversation. Um, the next person you're going to hear from today is, is the honey, the honey that everybody talks about. Um, honey is um, showing up today proudly as a Muslim woman. She is um, inspired by the possibility of transcending invisible barriers to community and increasing human to human connection. She's a facilitation, facilitator and an inclusion specialist. She runs an online program, A World of Belonging, where she advocates for heart-centered conversations that transform our identity narrative. She paints, cooks, and writes poetry. So that's Honey. And then the third person you're going to hear from, and then obviously you're going to hear from many other people who are on the call, is, um, is Peter Block himself. Now, Peter is a very good friend of mine. He's a friend of ours. He has, um, we're very lucky that he has been to South Africa a few times. He's the author of this amazing book. Many of us have had the opportunity to really dive deeply into the ideas in community, the structure of belonging. Uh, he has written many, many books. Many of you may have come across Flawless Consulting, which is one of the books that he's written. Um, he currently resides in Cincinnati, Ohio, and, um, and we're delighted to have Peter with us today. So some people have been attracted because Rosie is here, some people are because of Honey, some people because of Peter, and some people just to be part of this amazing community. So um, I'm going to ask um, these panelists to start us off by telling us just um, why does this topic matter to them? as individuals, as facilitators, as organizational development practitioners. And we're going to do it. We're going to hear from Rosie and then Honey and Peter. And I'm asking them to be quite disciplined and just not take more than two minutes each to just start us off here. So Rosie, we'll start with you. Thanks, Louise. Um, so I thought about this this morning and my granny came into my mind. Um, my granny is, if I could, if belonging was a person, was an experience, it would be my grandmother. And this year, in her absence, I'm having to swim in reconstituting what my belonging, my sense of belonging is, um, because she was such a big part of my life and my sense of belonging. But I know also as a family, as a community, we're also like navigating that space without her. Um, so personally, and also because I've always sort of been a wandering spirit and she was a bit of my anchor, <laughs> it's, it's refiguring out what it means for me to belong in that space. Um, on a professional level, I'm a time to think practitioner. I am committed, as you say, Louise, to how do we do that? that stuff around belonging and the 10 components we work with and then experiencing what it means when people can just show up. You know, so with my granny, I didn't need to earn my sense of belonging. It was, it was guaranteed. And I've seen how when we do that, even with the 
thinking environment when we convene in community building the magic. And I use the word magic because we discover and people discover actually that we're brilliant at thinking, that we're creative and we have something to contribute. And so for me as a facilitator, as a practitioner, as intentionally and deliberately creating those spaces and that's why it matters to me. Thank you, Rosie. I just want to um, say thank you for those of you who are sharing your thoughts in the chat. With a group of 90 people, we're not going to hear from everybody, but when you share your thoughts in the chat, we feel connected and we, um, we appreciate you uh, you're, you're bringing your voice into this conversation, even if it is through chat at this point. So thank you, Rosie. Thank you for everybody who's starting to share. Um, honey, why does this matter to you? Thanks, Louise. I think the truth is that often belonging matters to us most when we have experienced not belonging and when we've experienced it very deeply. So um, I certainly have experienced and witnessed the violence of exclusion, racism, sexism. And I often, I think, as a youth felt help, uh, quite helpless to effect any change. So whether these are challenges of belonging in our own families or broader issues that divide society, I think we often do feel like we want to transform something and we don't know how. And so as a youth activist in the 80s, you know, I believe that the social political systems that we operated in were simply wrong, just unjust, unfair, just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I took the approach that I needed to fight the system. I needed to point out all the faults. I needed to find, point out its harmful impact. And just this um, feeling that not enough, even now, not enough has shifted. But what has shifted for me personally is to look at the situation differently, to come to understand that actually these systems external to ourselves imprint on us disempowering narratives about ourselves. And that that's the first place that we need to actually start making shifts because those stories keep us stuck and they inform our action. And so we often find we're living our entire life from a narrative that was developed outside of ourselves. Um, so I think we have a responsibility to liberate ourselves from these stories, from these um, narratives and rewrite something, rewrite our story in a way that centers our own gifts, that centers our own sense that we bring gold and that we are offering something to the world. And then um, to develop an interest in uncovering that in others as well. You know, if we engaged others in a way that we were genuinely interested in who they are and what's this gift, what's the goal that they bring, then I believe we can co-create belonging and we can step into a space of being willing to unlearn harmful behaviors of exclusion and just be courageous, courageous to be in our own skin. So on my journey, I've realized that while we're taught many, many things at school, the reality is that we're not taught how to bring about this experience that human beings crave for, to be seen and valued and affirmed and appreciated. And so I practice this with my family, sharing my insights and my flaws and my mess ups and my learnings from what I'm discovering about myself. And what's at the root of my hurt? What's at the root of my anger? And, um, and then I invite my children to do the same, to be on this journey of self-discovery and to be sharing, you know, what are we, what shifts need to happen over here where we are? And how do we rewrite the story so that we can see ourselves transcending? Um, and now I bring that commitment to my work in various circles, including the Partners for Possibility work with you. And then in an online program called The World of Belonging, where I invite other people to start rewriting their narratives so that we can get beyond the old systems, the archaic systems that aren't working, that are keeping us stuck. And that's why this conversation matters to me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, honey. Peter. You must, I can, I know, I know Peter's face. He's already fallen in love with both these women. He says, why on earth would we start the day if we're not going to fall in love with a few people today? So, so he's kind of, he's hanging off Rosie and honey's every word. Peter, but now we want to hear from you. Well, uh, Louise, you know me better than I do. So <laughs> you're right. My day is complete. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know. I think we seek belonging because of our own isolation and loneliness. And it's not about people around us, it's just the story that I've carried for so long, that there's something wrong with me. Uh, I thought I was a wandering Jew, I thought I was a gypsy. And I remember being in a small group in Cincinnati, and you know, you write things down before you understand them, otherwise why would you stay interested? And so one of the small groups uh, I was in, and I always join them, even though I'm the 
quote, facilitator. And uh, the question was, what courage is required of you now? And uh, Damon and a friend of mine looked around, oh, Peter, okay, you're gonna participate or not? And I realized the courage that was required of me, it was to give up my story and stop thinking. Peter, the wandering Jew, the outsider, the marginalized person, the imperfect soul, married too many times. Am I willing to give up that story and join where I am? And I, as soon as you say it, you have to do it. You don't have a choice. That's what the everybody. And so I decided to join Cincinnati and become somebody here. And people ask me to do something, I'll do it. And that was really life-changing for me, not because I made such a difference. Honey, you know, I don't know what to do with my anger. I just try to save it for the middle of the night where no action is possible. Because during the day, it's not very powerful. I don't really think the mayor or the police are going to make much of a difference in this world. I don't think the whoever the president is going to make much of a difference. Some of them are worse than others. Top leadership mostly has power to screw things up. It's you and I and Puti and others that have the power to create an alternative, whatever room we're in. So I just decided the room would be my life. And, uh, And so I'm a place-minded person. There are communities of belonging, like this moment where I'm so thrilled to be outside my own country. I wish my body could follow where my eyes are because I'm just in a crazy place. But at the same time, who's in walking distance? Who are these people that I can walk to? Where can I spend my money close by? And to me, the COVID has created a great opportunity for that. And it's amazing to me, people don't want to go back to their jobs. And, you know, the, the dominant narrative has a lousy explanation. Well, we gave them money, we made it easy. Well, that's bullshit. They don't want to go to Bob's because those jobs stunk. They dehumanized us. They weren't worth much but money. And I think we've got a world now who would like to say, well, why don't we find a way to come together and make a living? in a way that affirms our humanity. And it's not that hard, even for older white men. You know, we are able to uncross our arms once in a while. This is the American middle-aged white man learning position. This is how we go through life. And, and the questions do it, the questions bring us together. And the more personal the question, the more uncomfortable the question, the faster we fall in love. And the problem with the six conversations that are world of it's too easy. I mean, I've been in so many rooms, alienated soul that I am, you know, leave me alone is kind of my favorite t-shirt I don't have the nerve to wear, to wear. And I say, break into small groups and tell people what's the crossroads you're at this stage of your life. And in 12 minutes, I ask them how to go. And they say, I, I'm not as alone as I thought I was. I'm not as crazy as I thought of. And maybe I don't need fixing. Why don't we give up on the development notion? I don't want to be developed. I want to be seen. I want to be, um, I want to let's do something together just for the sake of doing something together. But what do we care about? What do you see over here that bothers you? And that's where a guy named Gustavo Esteva changed my life. He wrote a book, The Future of Development. And, and I'll stop. But he said in 1949, Harry Truman, since the U.S. won the Second World War, theoretically, he said, we're going to be responsible. We're, we're doing well. We're going to help all these undeveloped countries. Got it? South Africa, India, all of Latin America, Haiti, Cuba. And he's Mexican. And he said, damn, I didn't know I was undeveloped until Harry Truman told me. I thought I was Mexican. But that thought changes everything because I'm out of the development business. People, I want, want to be developed. Well, let's talk. I'm even the facilitation business. Who am I? 
you know, we break into small groups with no facilitator. Because if you have a facilitator in a small group and they have a great experience, they say, shit, I need a facilitator. Where's my facilitator? I want my mommy. And so we have the language of coaching and development, and I do it in leadership development, organization development. But even that language has a colonial dimension to it. And so my, you know, how do I get out of that? And so I've, I would say you're leaders, Hani and Rosie, I would call you leaders. I know you facilitate, I know you run groups, but you are my idea of what leadership looks like. We used to call it facilitation, but now you break people in the groups, you design conversations, you time, that's leadership. And why don't we train, help leaders realize their only job is to help people who are in the room get closer together. And uh, now I've gone over my three minutes, which was no big surprise, I'll stop. You're not very good with timekeeping, but anyway, we love you. We still love you. So, um, Peter, this point around leaders and our story about leadership. Yesterday, we had a we had a conversation um, on Twitter Spaces. By the way, I just have to say to you, it was so much fun. I really want to do more Twitter Spaces conversations. Yeah. But, but Peter, um, I told a story about many years ago in South Africa. We have this um, this magazine program that that um, on a Sunday evening they told us you know share the state of the nation it's a very anyway and we were we were pitched this community was pitched to carte blanche with the name of the the the, the, the program as an example of something interesting that's happening in south africa and the message came back that they didn't think that we were very interesting because we didn't have a big name in, you know, we didn't have Trevor Manuel or one of the ministers or one of the chairman of one of the big companies. We only had us. And, um, and, and I don't know, Peter, whether you know that, um, that we now have about 3,000 people who are part of Pardons Possibility, who are leading change in their communities, just have decided we're not going to wait for elected officials and, you know, important people. We're just going to show up as citizens. And um, Marina said we should have told him about honey. Then maybe maybe Cod Blanche would have said yes to this this um, invitation to make a story about the, the but partners possibility. But and you know the whole Symphonia community. So we just want to I just want to acknowledge that every single one of the people on this call are leaders and they are citizens. They are people who decided we're no longer going to wait for someone else to create the future we want. We are stepping up and we are doing it ourselves. So, um, so Peter, I do want to, we did have a little bit more time for you, but I want to connect with Wilda's point around, um, you know, so why does this matter so much? Why does the idea of community matter? Why does belonging matter so much? I think we intuitively know why, but I want to hear your version of that, this story. And I've put a interesting question. So, so this last week we had the Thinkers 50, um, event and um, Amy Edmondson was was nominated number one, the, the the number one thought leader in the world, and it's because of of the work that she's been doing around psychological safety. Now, now my story is that you've been doing that work for a long time, so I want to hear whether you have any thoughts about um, belonging, psychological safety, and then very importantly, the role of the leader as convener. Which is, which is what our main topic today is. If we're going to create communities of belonging, then leaders have to know that that's their work. But we wanna hear your thoughts just on those few points. Well, it's a attention world. The dominant narrative is all about things going viral, uh, things gathering attention. It's about marketing. Uh, none of which takes us anywhere. It just doesn't. Uh, God bless you if you're an influencer. But what are you an influencer about? Your clothes, your song, your curiosity, the beauty of your being. So I, I just feel that uh, the theme of what you're saying is that we're all we have. And whoever's in the room is the people that we have virtual room, real room. And I don't need someone who can imagine the future for me or predict it for me. I'm not interested in the future. 
And I'm even less interested in the past because I know I made it up. I can give you some great stories when I was 2, 4, 12, 16, 18, 25, 42, 51. But at each point in your life, you construct what has meaning for you. But it's not true. It's not fact. And I think the work you're doing with Rosie and Hani and those coming is you're helping people in the moment say, what do we want from each other? What do we come here? What matters to us? And if you, that's why I'm saying that the leadership is what you know how to do. You put people in small groups. We didn't come for that. We came to hear from you. You're the author. Come on. Give us this small group crap. I say, I know you came. But I didn't come to meet your expectations either. We're both going to be deeply disappointed if anything useful comes out of this being together. I'm not here to meet your expectations. We're here to uh, go deeper and say, what are the things that concern us most of all in the domain in which we operate? And then how do we have Rosie and Hani and Bill and everybody else on this call say, well, who wants to take another step? That's leadership simple thing how about if we break into small groups and tell me what crossroads you're at at this stage of your life what kind of leadership is that i don't know do it I, i've learned if i just make eye contact and don't get too scared they'll do it and sometimes people come as couples and they, they say we're fine we'll stay together with like-minded people like-minded people are killing us and I say, I know you're fine. And then I take their hand and I say, would you please sit over? I know if they stay together, they're not going to be surprised. So part of leadership is helping be surprised from places that they never expected love to come from, which is a stranger. And when, I, when you talk about inclusion, it's, it's not raising my consciousness about people I don't know. It's helping me fall in love with stranger. And once you do that, then the world, then, then you become powerful. You feel, man, I made a difference. So those are the thoughts is like, let go of the leadership framework as being anything other than what we used to call facilitation. Louise is one of the most amazing leaders I've ever seen. And she's at her best when she's breaking people into small groups. And uh, that's power. Because that means that I will be accountable for the promises I make. If I'm waiting for leadership, it's an escape from accountability. And I'm only accountable for those things that I've shaped, that I've touched, that I've smelled, that i felt. And uh, to me, I'm writing a book about freedom and accountability again. I don't mind writing the same book over. And, uh, and the reason is we'll never create a culture of accountability if we don't confront people with their freedom. And to me, all the fascism, autocracy and a democracy no great leader all of that is an escape from accountability an escape from freedom i want donald trump to think he's going to make me safe and so i don't argue about that sorry i mentioned it erase it but i think that's what you all represent that's what louise gathers as people that know that uh, leadership is connecting people the woman asked, well, how do you measure belonging? Well, you just ask him one question. To what extent in the last 15 minutes do you feel you were yourself? Zero. Cool. Probably means you were at work. Ten. Cool. Meant you were family. And so all we're trying to do is help people be more who they are and realize there's nothing wrong with them. I never ask for feedback. I never use that word. People say, Peter, would you like some feedback? I say, no. Why? Because I know you're pissed off at me. Why don't you just tell, I'd like to know why you're angry with me. But don't package your disappointment in development, in feedback, in something that's going to make me better. I'm not going to get better. Don't you get that? Now, hopefully I'll wake up and learn to be a more loving, kind human being and not talk so long. But that's unlikely. This is it. And I think that you're confronting people with the fact in the world, they're fine. They're not crazy. And they don't need more coursework. You know, they need to study certain things if they want to be a doctor. But I just feel that to be long is to be myself in the presence of others. 
most last thought is most spiritual efforts are very individualistic. I go to temple, I go to church, and I walk in. They're nice at the door. I sit down, and I wait for the professionals to go to work. Okay, sooner or later, somebody up front got trained and paid. And they'll tell me how to spend these hours. I, I once gave a lecture, a sermon in a Christian church. Which I thought it was pretty cool for a Jew doing that. And I said, what do you want from me? And they said, only one thing, Peter. We want you to be done at five minutes to 12. That's all you want? That's all we want. I can do that. And then wherever you are, you make the room what you want it to be. Instead of talking into a bunch of pews, you have everybody stand up, walk around, and find two people they don't know. What kind of sermon is that? Where'd you come from? I don't know where I came from. I know I'm going to be done at 5 to 12. And then people walk around. So all of these are little moments that you construct to help people realize what they have is enough. It's just you're not alone. It's just not between me and God. I only see God's eyes when I look at all of you. And that's belonging. That's being connected. So, Peter, um, many people on this call may not know how this all came about, um, how we all got into community. Um, so for those of you who don't know the story, um, many years ago, I was very privileged to meet Peter at, at um, the launch of this amazing book. Um, and I invited him to South Africa and he had no idea what he said yes to. And then he came and many of the people on the school attended some of those early community building workshops that we attended and we experienced what Peter was talking about in those sessions. And that then led, led us, ignited us to kind of go, how do we not just let that stay in a room? How do we be, make that a way of showing up in the world? How do we make uh, what is um, in this book um, something that we can all live every day. And two of the most amazing exemplars of that, in my mind, are Rosie and Honey, as we've heard a few times. So Honey, um, we'd love to hear from you a little bit about um, why, why have you made uh, convening and, and creating opportunities for people to be in these conversations such a big part of your life? Why have you devoted a large part of your professional life to this work? Um, it's a big question. Um, as I agree with Peter, you know, the image of that wandering Jew, um, as a Muslim woman, I think we, I, I have a similar narrative. It can look like we're so different. And then I've got a similar narrative of, of not belonging, not fitting in, or constantly seeking that acceptance. And I see that there are quite a few people in the chat who resonated with that experience as well. Um, our own conversations of not belonging. Um, but I think what it points to is that there's this fundamental human instinct to belong. And it can't over, be overemphasized that in all the spaces and places where we do convene, belonging isn't just a nice to have. It's an essential. And just like we have the fundamental drive to survive, you know, with having food and shelter and safety and security, we equally have an instinct to affiliate to connect deeply with people, to be accepted and to feel and experience that we belong, that as we are fully flawed is absolutely okay. And so, um, you know, I find it so fascinating. Um, I recently watched uh, one of Gabo Matias' uh, films on um, trauma. And he was saying that if a child, a baby, a very small baby isn't, you know, held, cradled, um, touched, then that child can actually die from the stress of not having that affiliation, that connection to another human being. And so it just makes one wonder, you know, in communities where we are so fragmented, what is the impact on our youth or even older people on lifelong experiences of exclusion or of not good enoughness or of rejection? Um, so, so that's why it matters to me, like whether it's at the level of family or neighborhood or work environments, real or virtual, the thing that I think we need to ask ourselves is how? How am I paying attention to how I engage people? Um, am I paying attention to um, really being accepting and, and co-creating belonging with others? I think oftentimes in those environments, we're more focused on whether people meet our standards, whether they fit in with us, whether they're a good match for our current inner circle. 
rather than simply accepting who they are with a curiosity in uncovering, you know, what's the goal they bring that's definitely going to add value to our community, that's definitely going to make a difference to our group. So I think in this climate we're in where there's definitely a growing polarity in the world, whether that's around our um, socioeconomic situations, whether it's around climate change, whether it's around vaccinations, you know, or political power, it, we, it's like we've created every opportunity to polarize conversations and choose a us and a them. And so I think it's even more urgent that we create community wherever we are. And that's an experience of appreciation. Um, the appreciation that I can be fully me, that I can speak into the space fully as myself, that there's no need to pretend or put on some other mask or covering. And, um, and when we do that, then when, when I can show up, you know, fully myself, unapologetically, beautifully imperfect, just like everyone else, then I know myself to be courageous. And I also create the trust with others that it's okay to be oneself that there's no demand to be in a space of pretense. And so that space, that space can expand, that, that safety can expand because we're just gonna be who we are. And then we also have an access to solving bigger problems because as we know from you know, those aspects of the thinking environment is we, we get to think better when we're ourselves and there's no fear in the space. We get to really access our higher selves. And, and I truly believe that when leaders drive that process, um, then they amplify the experience of connection. And so I do think that people who have roles, titles, rank in organizations have a responsibility to highlight our shared humanity by driving that kind of process. So it really matters more now more than any other time, I think, that we, that we amplify our shared humanity, that we seek out opportunities to create connection. Oh, thanks, honey. We are going to go, after we've heard from Rosie, we are going to go back into small groups um, and we're going to get the opportunity to, to reflect on what you've heard so far. So be ready for that conversation to happen soon. Uh, but first, Rosie, your thoughts on, on and why, why does this matter so much to you personally with your unique narrative and background? Yeah. So, I mean, Louise, I... So I'm kind of two minds about this. I'll share the other part later. But as listening a story, a picture, a story picture, and facilitating, I know Peter, <laughs> and facilitating, and I see one of the principals we were working with at the time walk into the room. He was running a little bit late. The circle was already formed, and he could just pull up a chair and sit. And everyone welcomed him in that moment. And I remember at the tea break, he said to me, Rosie, I was running late, but I just had to be here because I know that when I'm here, I can just be myself and it's okay. And I can park everything that's happening. And with the people here, I'm okay. But I remember that particular circle because at some point I felt like I faded out of the facilitator role um, because something else was happening in the room with the people in the room and I remember having a moment of panic a little bit because you know as facilitator I meant to facilitate but suddenly I was unnecessary because there was such a sense of connection and the work was happening without without me being in the room and so I share that story because of another story where in the midst of feeling deficiency, but actually shifting the narrative to what's possible and what's available. People who'd felt excluded could suddenly show up and something that hadn't been possible was possible. But Louise, I kind of tie back a little bit to my own experiences as a person <laughs> and originally growing up in a different country and arriving in this country and the labels that I, I carried, but also felt like were imposed on me. And I think in the time, maybe I've moved on a little bit and some of those labels I didn't grow up or take on myself were, you know, being a woman, being black and suddenly feeling like I needed to behave in a particular way around those labels, but also just re, re looking that story for myself. And I think as I move through the world, as we move through the world, what are the labels that we put on other people? You know, so they don't have or 
they are poor or they can't, you know, all of those labels and the, I want to say the pressure, but how people could feel like that's the label that they've been given. So how do I show up, you know, against this lab label that's been provided? And if we're able to open up those labels and I've seen it is gosh, you know, Peter spoke about confronting people with their gifts and suddenly we're saying to people, actually there's something else here. Um, and our job is to create the space where you step into see that. I think that's quite exciting. Um, and I know through the work that I do, that I'm always, you know, in the thinking environment, there's this thing about people thinking to, the, to their cutting edge, to places they've never explored before. Um, and when they go there, they discover their genius and their magic. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. But it's their brilliance that they're encountering in those moments. And so how do we create that from how we know how to people put people into groups or how we know how to convene that people can find their own brilliance? Our own brilliance, but also our own not knowing. I remember a conversation with Peter. I was reminded of this this morning. I um, I was in a very dark place and I had no idea what to do. And I was just all over the show. And I spoke to Peter and I thought I was going to get some sympathy. And I didn't. I got the following from him. He said, Louise, maybe this is the authentic end to certainty. And I could see him celebrate this. And I kind of, all I wanted to do was smack him. But he was millions of miles away, so I couldn't smack him. But in you know now many years later I can look back at this and I go actually that was a really good it was a good experience for me even though I didn't feel like that in the moment but it was because we had created the sense of show up as you are with not knowing with with being in a dark place whatever it is so we're going to do that now for each other we're going to create an opportunity for everybody to go into a small group with two or three other people. And um, I'm going to ask you that you do your best to just create a space of acceptance and, um, and just being interested and curious in whatever you're going to hear. And um, be ready can to... I, can I say one thing? Yeah. Uh, one of the leadership facilitator ground rules is tell people don't be helpful to each other. Mm -hmm. Every time I'm helpful to you, I've colonized you in some small way. And people will ask you for advice. And if people ask me for advice, I say, I'll give you advice, but only if you agree to follow it ahead of time. And nobody ever follows up. And so let's be together in a way with the question of why does that matter to you? Like, like uh, Louise beautifully asked Rosie and, and Honey. But you have to, otherwise people will get helpful. They'll try to be helpful to each other. And it's never useful. Help is never useful, except maybe to extreme medical condition. Okay, sorry, I couldn't. Now put me no, in a small so group. Peter, we, we've taken that idea one step further because we also, I think you, but no, I, this is, you said this to us many years ago. You said being helpful is experience, can be experienced as a judgment. And so we don't want to judge each other. So we're going to let the judgment go. And um, the opportunity for you in, to, in small groups to just go and make sense of the experience so far. Uh, so, and obviously we would have loved to stay here together for the whole day, but we don't have the whole day. So we're gonna make the most of these few minutes. So I'm opening the rooms and um, we're going to give you another, uh, yeah, so seven minutes. So go and enjoy yourself. Spend it, spend some time with amazing people and share with them your latest, freshest thoughts about what we've talked about so far. Oh. Um. So welcome back everybody. I hope that you had a good conversation and an opportunity to be connected with a few amazing people. Um, we do want to create an opportunity for a few of you if anybody want to share. It was too short. I know Anita, um, this is the challenge with only 90 minutes. We should have days together. So um, 
but let's celebrate the fact that we did have a chance to be in a conversation. Peter, I see you unmuted. Did you want to say something specific about what happened in your room? Or what struck you? Well, I, it, again, it proves how easy it is to fall in love. And uh, it's so nice not to have to be anything other than you are. And listen to two amazing people, you know, and uh, it's always too short. Life is too short. This was too short. But most of the time people say, hey, Peter, we need more time. And I always say, look at me. Don't talk to me about needing more time. I'm out of it. And I think if people know that the time is short, then you get out of it. And, and, uh, but it's, uh, we're also amidst people that came. You all showed up for a reason. And, and it's, it's criminal as I will not get to know most of you. But two is enough, four is enough. And then you take that into the world and you don't worry about scale. There's nothing more colonial and more dictatorial than measuring my world by scale, speed, and convenience. So what this belonging is about is letting go of what's convenient and letting go of how long it takes, how fast it can move. And what scale? You know, I don't, I don't know what scale is anymore. And, uh, all I know is that I need for me to live out whatever intention I might have had. I need you desperately. And I may not even have met you yet. You know, that's why I think that the strange is so important. I'll never be surprised by like-minded people. Thank you, Peter. Let's hear. I see that Kanse has unmuted herself as well, or himself. Do you want to share with us your thoughts, Kekansi? Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, again. Can you hear me all? We can, yeah. Okay, thank you again. Um, a sense of belonging is a deep one. And it, it reflects on us on different ways. I, I would like to share my, my, my reflection on it. I grew up in a village. I was raised by my granddad and my grandmother. My mother was a teacher. She used to come home during school holidays. And I was privileged because my granddad worked in the mines. So he had money to take us to school. He had basic things that a kid can, can need for school. But when you go to school, you lose a sense of belonging because of the groups that are there, of the bullying. Even if you come from a background that is Christian or that's got firm family values, because of not having self-confidence and being bullied, you lose a sense of belonging. And that, for me, is a baseline to say kids at school must be given equal opportunity. And when a child says something, they must be listened to regardless of where they come from. Thank you. Thank you, Kikansi. And I think that's a lot of what we are trying to do with, with um, Partners of Possibility is to really create spaces where, where the adults belong and where the children belong too. But it's wonderful to be reminded of that by you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, anybody else want to share with us, Mark? Lovely to have you on the call, Mark. Oh, thank you, Louise. I want to come from a very humble space. And um, I really like to strip away all the intellect for a second and just say, no, I'm seeking acceptance. And that's why I'm here. If this is a space to be accepted. then that's meaningful by itself. You know, um, and I think we all really underneath want that. As I am, as you are, you know. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for that reminder. I think if anybody wants to say, I don't need acceptance. I'm not sure that you are paying attention. We all need acceptance. We all want to be a, belong, feel that we belong for who we are. Thanks, Mark, for that honesty. I had one more th thought, Louise, uh, and you, you activated it, Mark. It's enough to pause. 
and put the intellect aside, period. And you did that in your breathing and the way you showed up in that little square you're sitting in, okay? Also, if we wanna raise a child, in my world, we've outsourced everything that matters to me. I've asked the school to raise my child. I've asked the police to give me, keep me safe. I've asked the medical profession to extend my life for no reason that I can come up with, but other than I'm nervous. Uh, our belonging has those jobs to do without the professionals. And I think we belong to overcome my isolation. And that we just all looking for that acceptance. At the same time, let's talk about how do we want to raise our children? How do we want to stay healthy? And uh, how do we want to keep our neighborhood safe? We have the capacity to do that. We don't need more professional expertise. And that to me is the practical side of a neighborhood, practical side of belonging. This is we have something to do, which is the things that matter most to us. Uh, a friend of mine, and I'll stop, is a heart surgeon. He doesn't want repeat customers. Paul, he opens up your heart, fixes it and sends you away and says, don't come back. Very different than the than, uh, cell phones where they want you to come back before you even left the yard. But he says the ones that join a group and stay with it over years, never come back. And the ones that think they can make it on their own, they're the ones I see again. And I just thought that's such a simple, beautiful, expression of why we need each other is to is to live a little longer and to raise a little child and be safe so i just wanted to say there's a function to belonging but i'll take it for its own sake absolutely sorry that's all fine we love you peter for who you are and just how you are um so uh, let's hear be before i go back to rosie and um and honey, let's just, who else? Uh, Putty, you unmuted. Did you want to make a contribution? Share your thoughts. Yeah, I want to I wanna just have a, some, uh, something quick here. Uh, what Peter said earlier on, it's still on my mind. And, uh, you know, I, I see things differently. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, this needs to be elaborated a bit. It may not be on this platform or something like that. If he says, you know, we should not be helping each other. For me, and he said, because, you know, if we help each other, because, you know, sometimes, you know, he says, if you don't help, if you help someone, they don't follow uh, what you say or something along those lines. Maybe, you know, in him or someone helping me, I do not necessarily have to follow them because their help comes from their own perspective, you know. I may be facing things differently and what he is saying or the help that I'm getting that I'm going through. So uh, my feeling and my thinking there is maybe what I need to do is get what he's saying and then if it is helping, I can do things differently according to how I see them or I can follow what he's saying. But Help comes from a uh, different perspective. So we don't necessarily have to follow uh, the help that we were seeking. And also once we are in a community, there's no way we can avoid helping each other. We cannot avoid that. Just my views. Yeah, so Putty, the, the, the advice against help is really against our tendency to think we know better and that we're gonna go out and we're gonna be helpful to other people because they just need to know what we see. And I don't know about you, but in my community, that's very prevalent. It's very prevalent for me. And, and so I've had to learn how to hold back on my being helpful. And the, the, the guidance I got from Peter many years ago is he says, replace help with curiosity. Get interested. Because when we get interested, something happens for both of us. When I just want to be helpful to you, it's, I often think, but it's because I don't need you. But if we realize that there's reciprocity in our relationship, that when we are interested and curious in what the other person is thinking and what they're going through, and when we ask them, why does that matter to us, then, then something becomes possible for both of us. That's not possible when I think 
when I'm in that arrogance position where I think my job is to help you. Does that help, Bucci? Does that, does that explain why we yeah, I, I, I hear you, you are correct. Hence I'm saying it needs to be put into perspective because we are making a blanket statement now that you know, help cannot be and should not be in all situations, which is what I know I'm trying to guard against. Sometimes, uh, you know, the little that we say will be helpful to someone. You know, you raise this and I'm able to see things from a different perspective in terms of um, what I'm going through. You are helpful to me in that case. So help does not necessarily mean you do something for me. It just says, you know what? I am able to grow up mentally. I am able to grow up emotionally and that's help. Because previously I did not see that, you know what? Being helpful in that sense, it's not uh, the way to go about things. I am helped now, so. Got it. Thank you very much, Putty. You're making us all think now. I want okay. to, I'm conscious of time. So I want to give um, Honey, Rosie and Peter another opportunity to just share with us their freshest thoughts in response to what they've heard so far and in response to the conversations they had in the small groups. And this time we're going to start with Honey, we then go to Rosie and then Peter. So Honey, over to you. Thanks, um, Louise. Yeah, um, I actually was making some notes as I was listening to different um, people's responses and their thoughts. And what struck me was, you know, it sounded so complex at the beginning when um, somebody asked how do we measure belonging and what exactly do you do to create belonging? And, and yeah, everybody's had an experience of connection and acceptance and maybe giving ourselves permission to just be ourselves. And what strikes me is that it's so simple and a, a huge access to that is something that, um, you know, Mary Jean just defined so clearly in our conversation, which is as a large role in many of my programs as well. And that's just the simplicity of listening, the power of giving full and delicious attention to the person who's speaking with the commitment that you are, you know, putting aside all your thinking and judgment. And, and I think that brings me to the second point, which I'm hearing emerge from the various conversations. And, and that's what I also said at the beginning is heart-centered conversation. When, we, when we're sitting in the, in the heart space, we have to let go of that intellect. Um, we have to let go of um, overthinking and assessing everything because we want to open the space to really feel and connect with the other person. And, and the heart space holds that um, access to courage and care and compassion. And, and so I'm just getting, you know, the simplicity of listening, of opening the heart space. And then I'll just love the, what really struck me over and over again, um, Peter, and every time I hear it is the little time it takes to fall in love with someone. And I think we don't give ourselves that permission again to just meet even the people we are most familiar with, to just meet them in a pure moment with a willingness to fall in love. And I think that, if we just go simple things out of this conversation, then we definitely all are empowered and fully equipped to create belonging where we are. So, so that's what I want to walk away with. Um, and the antithesis of that is coming from our assumptions and our certainty and our knowing and our expertise. So yeah, that, that's what strikes me right now. Thanks, um, honey. I, I, I'm, I'm getting such a sense of why all these people have shown up because of honey when you speak. Um, Rosie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Rosie is one of my heroes. So, you know, we all come with our heroes. She's one of mine. So, I mean, I'm, I'm tuning in to what it feels like in my body at the moment in this conversation. And it feels open. It feels welcoming. Like, I feel like I got a bit more oxygen in my brain flowing. Um, and it's this conversation, it's the people in this room. And so for me, I, I'm kind of sitting here with what it feels like in the body and the experience of being, of feeling like I belong or having this conversation that start to, you know, connect people. And when I arrived in my breakaway room, um, Jill and I started the conversations and Mojito was like, oh, you guys know each other. And Jill and I were like, no, we've never met. This is the first time we're seeing each other. <laughs> Um, and I think that it was so cool to have that experience um, and to what Peter and Han 
we've spoken about you know, like falling in love with people and in those three four five minutes we were together it's the sense of connection already even though we've never met each other um and i wrote the word freedom down earlier on when all of the conversations were happening and i thought about freedom the freedom to be myself the freedom to think well the freedom that comes when i feel like i belong and what that freedom enables me to do when I'm simply myself. And so for me, I think the word freedom is what's sticking out for me right now as we're in this conversation. Thanks, Rosie. Hira, love to hear your precious thoughts about this. I need myself. Uh, Mostly, I'm just happy to be with you all. And Foodie, I, a friend of mine said something. He, who, before he gave a talk, he said, I'm going to warn you. If you argue with me, I'm going to take your side. And I love that. <laughs> and I love you coming up twice speaking. And I'm just happy to listen to you. And, and there, you know, in perspective. Everything you say is true, so I just want to thank you for that. Uh, and I also think we're, organizationally, we're terrified of freedom. And maybe our work in the world is to get over that and let people make more choices than we did. And And the context we live in is probably set in the first three sentences that Louise, as soon as Louise invites us into the room together, it's just the way she says what we're here for makes it so. And I think you all this, have that opportunity to make the context explicit and early. And, uh, and you don't have to know much more than that other than to get people talking to each other about things they're not used to saying. And so you say conversation is a radical political act in my mind, because I'm asking people to sit with strangers and have conversations they're not used to having. And, uh, you know, said, let's stop the intellectual, the conversation I'm not used to having is really pretty simple. What's the crossroads I'm at at this stage of my life? What's the gift I've not fully brought into the world? Uh, what's the resentment I hold that nobody knows about? What are you talking about? Leave me alone. I'm, I will leave you alone. But even if when you ask these very personal questions, something happens. And even people say, I don't want to answer that. You say, thank you. Don't leave the circle. There's no requirements in this circle. And People get that, and I think that's what makes us powerful politically. I've had people run for office, and instead of giving speeches on the campaign trail, they say, hi, I'm running for mayor of a city in Colorado. I'd like you to break you into groups of three and say, why is it important for you to be here tonight? And people are like, what kind of campaign is this? This is how I want to be mayor. I'm here not as a supplier. I'm here as a partner in helping you create the kind of city that you want to inhabit. And if you get clear about that, people get it. And the ones that don't get it, that's fine too. So you can take these things anywhere. Uh, and, and the stranger the place, the last thing is, I've always loved invitations from strange places. I got invited by the CIA once. So they're not my favorite group. But... I figured this is how God speaks to me. And so I went and they put a hood over my head. They let me talk for a day to the CIA agents in the United States that aren't supposed to be any. Uh, when we went to lunch, they asked them to lock up their notes. And when I went to the bathroom, he wouldn't let me lock the stall. Well, that's an unusual place. But I'm grateful for that. And that's all, that's what the stranger brings us to. That's what I found when I came to South Africa. Uh, the world was not as sophisticated as I was used to. And I fell in love with that. 
And so anyway, it's, it's just more of the same, but uh, thank you, Louise, you're, you meant the world to me. And then whoever you bring in the room, you know, where have, where have you been, damn it? That's the cranky side. So, so Peter, you've told us that every time we convene, we get to create the world that we are committed to. Yeah. And um, this conversation with you and Rosie and Honey and everybody on this call, that's the world I want to live in. And so I feel so privileged to have spent this time this afternoon. So I want to just, um, we've got three minutes, seven minutes left. I do want to do a final round with Honey and Rosie, but um, anybody else want to say something? Maybe um, appreciation that you want to yeah. express? Maybe a final thought? Um, I'm going to keep my eyes on any person unmuting themselves. You will get a chance to speak. Please don't hold back. We do want to hear your voice if you've got something that you want to contribute. Especially to each other, you know. Yeah, absolutely. To, to you were in the room with, but I see Bill is unmuted and then Tessa. Let's go to Bill and then Tessa. I, I just need to say thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone on the on this call today. You opened up a huge space in my life, and I'm sure in every one of us, even though some of us have been at this for a while. It doesn't matter how long we're at it. It just keeps opening more space. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. And thank you for showing up to, to when we invite you. It's always wonderful to have you in the room. Um, Tessa. So thank you very much, uh, Peter, Honey, and Rosie. Um, you have given us some gold nuggets this afternoon. Um, again, uh, Peter, I um, was on one of your um, your uh, workshops a couple of years ago, and it has enlightened me so much in terms of how we need to to connect with each other. Um, and this afternoon, you've just reiterated that. Um, I think the importance for me is how we can instill these practices and behaviors in our children um, and into the educational space, because I wish I knew now, um, knew then what I know now, <laughs> and I wish I'd learned it all <laughs> a lot of years ago <laughs> um, before the grey hair set in. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. And that is my, my mission to take it into the, the educational space of children. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. I also, that is so beautiful. I, I just want to acknowledge Marilise's um, note in the chat. And Marilise, I think you need to tell us a little bit more. But she said, I'm married today because of your work, Peter. And the safety it gave me to engage in deep conversations to connect. Marilise, are you willing to share just a little more about that story? We're all curious <laughs> now. And then we want to hear from Jackie. And then we'll end yeah. with Paul. Marilise? Paul, Louise. Um, and thanks for that. Um... I found myself in a space where I am uh, married to uh, an Indian guy and, you know, it had his own challenges, the, the, the relationships and the culture and everything that comes with it. And, and I just eventually I got stuck. And then Louise Brits, um, also part of Partner of Possibility, I got introduced to her. She introduced me to this and I saw a wonderful opportunity to try out a different way of engaging in conversation and, and just having a free space where you could just be authentic and, and just talk about what you want, um, what are the crossroads, you know, what is what, what appreciation do you have just moved us forward. And um, those are some of my stories that I actually share when I do get an opportunity to engage in conversation and just, you know, the impact that it has on both me and, and my husband. And I will be forever grateful because it was just, it was very, it was, it was just profound in my life. And I am where I am today because of that. Oh, wow. That is so exciting. Oh, that is so exciting. I get goosebumps. Thanks, Marlise. We're going to hear from Jackie, and then we're going to give our panelists each a last final thought to share. And um, many, uh, some, you will all know Tilly Maranzella. A while ago, I was on a, on a panel with her, and she, she came to me at the end. She said, Louise, I want you to give us some patkos. And I think that's just such a wonderful idea. Um, Peter, patkos is, is that food that you pack when you go on a road trip, road food. <laughs> So we'll come to you at the end for some patkos. Let's hear from Jackie and then um, and then we're going to go to Rosie, Honey and Peter. But let's go. Let's hear from Jackie first. 
Thanks, Louise. And uh, I just love the serendipity that Baron Lees, who I was in a room with, just shared what she shared. Because uh, the reason I'm here is my dear friend Heine gave me Peter's book to read in creating community as I'm preparing to get married in March um, and connecting our two families. So, Peter, like you, I'm a little bit of a wandering Jew, although I haven't left Cape Town for too long. Um, and my partner is Hossa, and so this bringing together of our two tribes, clans, um, really is all about like how to how to create belonging with two, on the face of it, seemingly different groups, but not at all different. Um, and um, I'm more excited, um, Hani. I must confess, I haven't yet opened the pages of the book, but I will now. So it won't be returned in a little while, but uh, I'm more excited about this conversation from today because just so aware of asking and what I take away is asking questions that open space as opposed to putting something in the space, trying to be helpful and creating that as a space of engagement um, as, we, as we create belonging. So thank you so much for today. Jackie, I just want to say I'm so excited to hear your story. I'm so excited to hear Marilee's story. So, our, you know, we've always talked about our work is about strengthening the fabric of South African society. Both of you have now given us a completely different perspective on what, on what that actually means. And that is so exciting. So we'll hear as a final thought. Thank you for everybody who's sharing their thoughts in the chat. I, I'm going to um, enjoy reading all those those chats um, messages afterwards but we'll end with um, final thoughts put course from Rosie and then Hani and Peter to end our time together today. Thanks Louise. Um, I think for me it's leaving with a sense of being I'm inspired by everybody who's in the room today um, and energized uh, <laughs> into yeah into what what, what to do next? I mean, I know what to do. I'm using the words what to do next, but what does it mean as I move from this conversation uh, to create belonging for myself and others and, yeah, intentionally be convenient? You <laughs> remind you. me, Rosie, of Peter's book that says, the, sorry for that dog. Peter's book says the answer, um, for, for this, the, the, the answer to how is yes. And Rosie, you, your yes has just been so amazing to all of us so you know you've got it in you you create belonging every time you show up in the room it's a wonderful wonderful experience for me to work with you honey over to you thanks louise so yeah i'm just deeply moved by all the love and support and encouragement in the room if i ever wanted to feel like a celebrity today was the day and i had no idea <laughs> so um just appreciation to you know, the many different people who showed up and then really showed up in the conversations with whoever you met in your breakaway rooms. Um, you asked about pop course, and I think there's always the opportunity to extend the conversation. So even when we log off, like, where do we take the conversation next? For me, that's always, I'm going to go back into my home and I'm going to share with my family. And I always invite people to identify who's the one person you're going to go share something out of this conversation with because then we keep the conversation alive and we don't have to wait for the next person to convene the next gathering we're actually keeping the conversation alive where we are and and I think that's really powerful and that's that's how Jackie got that book and that's how things are spinning so I'm also looking forward to how that chapter ends and the exciting things that she's going to do with it Jackie when you do crack it open um but yeah who's, who's the next person you're going to take this conversation to like as soon as we sign off that's the part goes and honey i just want to say that for, for me you embody two things you embody invitation many people today showed up because of your invitation and you embody belonging i've been in a, I've, got, I've, I'm, I've been privileged enough to be in a few conversations with you over the years and i look forward to many more and you and i will convene many conversations here in cape town and i cannot wait to have jackie in that room so thank you for showing up today and for 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 just being invitation and belonging peter you have the final word and the final pot course for us you know i'm losing my voice and my wife and god 
I think are telling me that I've said enough. And uh, I feel that way right now. I'm, I'm just grateful I would, you know, you're just left with gratitude. Uh, I get little hints that maybe something I did made a difference to people, which is all you ever dream about. And if it's three people or five people, maybe six, take it. And uh, Tessa, I was thinking, you know, I wish I'd known then what I know now. So all you're left with is to beg forgiveness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I would say the same to all of you. Anyway, thank you so much for being together with each other and let me sit with you. Really? There's not much for a trip, but what I got. Uh, yeah, well, um, have a fantastic rest of your day. I hope the in the year is ending well for you. That you'll have a, fun, a wonderful time with loved ones over over the festive period, and um, that we'll we'll start our year with with new energy in January. And um, go and have a fantastic afternoon, rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.